Hello, and welcome to Person-Centered Care and Substance Use Treatment, Just the Facts. My name is Marcus Doherty, and, I'm the, I am, and I am the Assistant Director of Healthcare Reform Consultation for the Managed Care Technical Assistance Center here at Center on Addiction. Today we're going to talk about person-centered care. <clears throat> so I guess our first question is, what is person-centered care? So person-centered care is the ability for the clinician to view the client as the expert on his or her own life. Additionally, we view the client as being self-determined and having self-determination and being able to make choices for him or herself. So within a person-centered framework, self-determination and choice are encouraged. Additionally, clients' hopes, capabilities, capacities, interests, preferences, needs, and abilities are identified and respected. Lastly, educated risks and setbacks are viewed as part of the recovery process. Person-centered care through the clinician's lens, lens means that we work actively to engage clients in their decision-making process. Additionally, we work with clients where they are, and we acknowledge clients' strengths, and we honor their strengths as well. And we always treat clients with respect and with dignity. So some facts on person-centered care include the fact that person-centered care is not clinician-driven. Actually, it's client-driven. So we as clinicians, we work together with clients to reach agreed-upon goals or outcomes. And collaboration is always important in person-centered care to reach objectives, and to reach treatment plan goals. Some of the dynamics of person-centered care include cultural and interpersonal factors. So some cultural factors may include being mindful of where clients originate from. And what I mean by that is we may work with clients that have migrated to to this country, from other parts of the world, and additionally, clients that have my, that may have migrated to our particular location from other parts of the country, so they can be um, cultural differences that may speak to location, that may speak to um, where a client came from and to the other parts of the world. And not only do we look at cultural factors, or dynamics. We also look at interpersonal dynamics. For example, what is a client's view on receiving treatment or working with someone? What is a client's view on working with a counselor or a therapist? What is a, a family's view about a client coming into treatment? So those will be examples of some interpersonal dynamics that may impact or impede the treatment process and dynamics that we as clinicians need to be sensitive to. So these are potential challenges that we as clinicians need to identify, but also become sensitive to and be caring towards. And we always need to work with clients in a trauma-informed manner. So what I mean by a trauma-informed manner is assuming that, that most clients have experienced some form or level of trauma. So when we make that assumption, we approach our work with clients in a very caring and sensitive manner, being a, being very aware that, that trauma does exist and we want to approach it in a very caring and sensitive manner. What are some of the key components of person-centered care? One of the key components is making decisions together. So when clients and clinicians are faced with the task of making decisions, 
they should be made in a manner that is really a sharing of information and really a sharing of pros and cons around a decision. So actually, this particular present center approach is called shared decision making. And it really involves active engagement of clients and activities and discussions that lead to client-driven decisions. Why is this important? It's important because very often in healthcare, there's no single right decision that a client can make around his or her own health. So because there's no single right healthcare decision, clients need to have as much information as possible in order to make a decision that's best for them. So just to recap briefly, um, there is no one reasonable option very often. Um, there is no one option that has a clear advantage. And the possible benefits and challenges of each option or each decision can affect the client differently. So the framework or the goal of shared decision making is to give clients information, education, to make an informed decision that's best for them. What are the key components of effective decision making? Well, one component is information, and briefly, that involves giving the client as much information about a treatment decision or option that's possible. Um, the next component is in, is educating. So very often we as, as, as clinicians or counselors have education and training around a particular area or aspect of a decision. So our role would really be to educate the client in terms of, say, the best evidence-based practices or what the current research trends are around an option that a client may be considering. Another role that's important in a shared decision-making process is responsibility. So what is the client's role in facilitating a decision once it's made? And what is the clinician's role in terms of making, in terms of following through on a decision once it's made? So this should also be discussed and explained and those roles should be clearly identified. So that could help in facilitating the completion of the decision once it's made. Also, values are important. Decisions should be steeped in clients' values, and we need to be able to respect those values in which the client makes a decision and or through. Preferences are also important as well. Um, and those should always be client-driven. Now, an important aspect to keep in mind in terms of working from a person-centered framework and working from a shared decision model is that whether or not we agree with a client's decision, we're always supporting a client in his or her decision-making process and their decision. So um, that's an important and key aspect of working from a person-centered um, perspective and also working in a shared decision-making process. What are the benefits of making decisions together? Often when decisions are made together, clients actually learn about their health condition and they understand their health options or outcomes. So this is important. So by educating a client about his or her condition, you're also informing and educating, and you're also helping them to learn what potential outcomes could be. That helps them to make informed decisions. We also help them to recognize that decisions have to be made or decisions need to be made, and that decisions that are made should be informed decisions. So if a client is presented with several out, um, options, they make a decision of an option based on the based on the information they received and the education they received, and um, if it's in line with their values and their preferences, and we respect that decision. Additionally, clients use the information and education that we provide as a tool to evaluate their options. So this is important because it allows a client to compare options from an informed perspective 
and to contrast options also in an informed manner as well. And when clients make decisions that are based on information and education, they're more likely to follow through on the decision once it's made. So the whole concept of getting buy-in through this process is also critical. Okay, I'd like to briefly talk about some red flags in person center care. And I think of red flags in two areas, in terms of one's thinking and in terms of one's language. In terms of one's thinking, very often we're trained as clinicians to be viewed as the expert. But in a person-centered approach, we are not the expert in terms of a client's life. We might be an expert in terms of what we learned through our education and training, but we're clearly not the expert on a client's life. So one of the approaches to take in terms of working from a person-centered perspective or lens is not to view yourself as an expert, but to view yourself as open and receptive to hearing and attending to what that client's life experience is as they tell it to you, what the narrative is on a client's life. Knowing what's best for the client, we don't know what's best for the client um, because we haven't lived that client's experience. What we hope to do is to, in a shared decision-making model, be able to, to inform and to educate clients around options based on what their life narrative or, or what their life history has been, and to educate them around the options that are available. This client will fail unless um, our failure or our perception of a failure is not a client's failure. Um, and we shouldn't go into to any work with a client in a person-centered way thinking that a client will fail unless they follow our thinking or what our plan is. Because the plan should always be a plan that's mostly agreed upon based on education, information, um, valuing the client's opinion and their value system. So failure, failure in terms of the process should not be considered as part of the shared decision-making process or in person-centered work. Language. Very often we may view a client as being difficult as wanting to do things his or her way, um, having her own ideas, and as being non-compliant. Well, I would challenge us to think about this differently in terms of language. So if Ms. Jones is difficult, is it that she's really difficult, or is it that she has a different perspective, or she wants to advocate for her needs, or she wants to advocate for her way of thinking, which in a person-centered approach is exactly what we want. We want clients to be able to advocate, to speak to what their needs are, and to think about how they want to pursue their treatment. Okay, she wants to do things her way. Again, um, something that we should advocate and we should explore and discuss with clients. So in, a, so in many ways, a client that is difficult and wants to do things her way is really a client that's advocating for, for oneself, which should always be encouraged. Um, a client that has her own ideas, again, a client that's, that's advocating for oneself. Okay, noncompliance um, is really not noncompliance. It's really a client telling you that, that they want to pursue a different path, that the path that they're on is not the path that they want to pursue. So in a person-centered framework, that is something to be honored, respected, and to be explored. Challenging moments in person-centered care. So these three examples kind of highlight what what many SUD providers may have experienced or have experienced um, in their work. Um, the first example speaks of Mr. Jones and his toxicology results um, that were positive for cocaine for five consecutive weeks. So instead of viewing this as a failure, this is actually an opportunity. Um, one of the slides earlier spoke about um, the fact that relapse could be a part of one's recovery process. So this would be an opportunity to further explore 
what else it is that Mr. Jones needs to expand his recovery, to continue to stay in his recovery, and to discover and to talk about further options and other options that might be beneficial. So as opposed to toxicology results positive and being viewed as a negative, it's really an opportunity for further exploration and further work. The next scenario, next example, speaks of a Miss Smith in a residential program who's about to complete and go back to live with a brother who's actively using cocaine and marijuana. So for some SUD providers in residential treatment that may have experienced this, this may feel like a frustrating experience, but again, working from a person-centered perspective, we may not always agree with a client's decision, but client's decisions are client-driven. So our role is always to be supportive, okay? Clients decisions have to be their decisions, their preferences, okay, but we support those decisions. If the decision doesn't work out, we always take a supportive stance. We always continue to work with clients, okay? So person-centered allows clients to make their decisions based on information and education, and although it may not agree with what we think should happen, it's always client-driven. The third scenario speaks of, of Mary's toxicology results that are positive for volume, but she wants to have weekly take-home bottles of methadone. The two, may, the, the two pieces of information in this example may seem contradictory, but from a person-centered perspective, again, it's an opportunity for exploration. It's an opportunity to work with Mary to get to a point where she eventually can have take-home bottles of methadone. So a shared decision-making approach or model might include a plan of action that could eventually get her to that. So as opposed to looking at, at this example as two opposed concepts or views, again, it's really an opportunity to work with Mary to get to that goal. Okay. So in a person-centered perspective, we want to look at a person's strengths and we want to look at a plan that can get them to mutually agreed upon goals. The next few slides speak to a vignette uh, regarding a person by the name of Sheila, Sheila and an intake appointment. So in this vignette, Sheila is a 29-year-old um, single female who was referred to your chemical dependency outpatient program by a friend. She's calling the intake department because she wants to set up an appointment. So in her call, she reaches the outreach worker, Ms. Nelson, who says, thank you for calling Shuttering Gardens. How may I help you today? Sheila says her name is Sheila Jones, and she's calling because she wants to schedule an intake appointment to get into the program. The intake worker says, sure, she can help her with that, and she has appointment times for this afternoon and tomorrow. Are you available between this afternoon and tomorrow? Sheila replies, that's too soon. I need to schedule an appointment for next week. The intake worker thanks Sheila for sharing her availability and tells her that we usually prefer to schedule individuals as soon as possible. May I ask why you're requesting an appointment for next week? So I want to stop the vignette right here just to point out a couple of things that are important. One is that the intake worker, as opposed to stopping the call or as opposed to making a hard decision about when it's going to intake appointment, she actually explores the reasons why or the reason why Sheila wants to schedule for next week. Okay, so... This is the beginning of an information sharing process in a shared decision making approach. So as opposed to, to having this this linear concept of if you can't schedule it now then I can't help you, she's exploring um the reason why Sheila wants to schedule for next week. So in the next slide, Sheila says, you know, she needs to arrange for a baby 
for a babysitter for a three-year-old, and she can't do that until next week. So the intake worker thanks Sheila for that information, but also provides her some information and says, um, do you realize basically that the center here offers child care services on site while you're receiving services? Because Sheila says she wasn't aware of that. Okay, And then the intake worker goes on to say um, that this is a service that we offer to our program participants. Our child care specialists are trained and certified to work with infants to children six years of age. And if she is interested, she can schedule an intake appointment as well as schedule for child care services for Sheila's daughter the day of her appointment. Now, there's a couple of things here that I just want to point out that are important in terms of a shared decision shared decision-making process. The intake worker shared information about the program. Sheila shared information about what her needs were. She, uh, the intake worker educated Sheila around the available options that she has that the program can offer, mainly that there are child care services on site. Um, and then she um, told her that she can help arrange those that appointment for child care services at the same time that um, Sheila can schedule her intake appointment. So again, options were made available, information was provided and shared, and education was provided. So Sheila asked another question. She asked, well, on the days that I had groups of sessions with my counselor, could I bring my daughter? And the intake worker answers, yes, as well as for any other services that she receives on site. Sheila says that's really great. She's provided with information. She can make an informed decision. So the intake worker thanks Sheila for her compliment and, again, provides her with options. Um, she gives her the option of, of she can schedule the intake appointment and child care services, or Sheila can continue to, to work on scheduling her own child care options. So, again, we see options made available. Okay. Sheila says thanks. And then the intake worker asked her, would she like for us meeting the program to schedule the intake appointment, child care services, or would she still want to schedule for next week? Sheila decides she wants to schedule for the day after tomorrow. Okay. And the intake worker is very accommodating. Um, and flexible. She offers some morning and afternoon times and asks what works best for her. Sheila decides that late morning works best because she needs to get her daughter ready. And the intake worker offers a Friday at 11 o'clock um, to Sheila, and Sheila agrees. She says yes. So the takeaways that I think that are important from this webinar is that in the shared decision-making model, it's important that we inform and educate clients that we also collaborate, that we also respect their preferences, that they, again, have options, and that we respect their, their choices, and we continue to remain open and collaborative. Okay, we always work with our clients with compassion, caring, and respect for their values, and we always work through the lens of person-centered practice. So those are the takeaways that I hope that you've gotten from this webinar and that you will consider in your future work. And I'd like to thank you for listening to this webinar. I hope it was helpful, and I want to wish you the best in your, in your work with our clients. Take care.